Atheist Nomads episode 106, news for August 6, 2015. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low price, full featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A R C H W A Y hosting.com. Hey, we're also brought to you by listeners just like you. Find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash atheist nomads. That's P A T R E O N dot com forward slash atheist nomads. The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing and talking about hoo haws. Please be advised. We are the Atheist Nomads bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. This is episode number 106. I am Dustin. Joining me as always is Wesley. Hello, everybody. And becoming a regular, we have Lauren with us again, my lovely wife. Hello. Lauren, welcome. Thank you for inviting me on again. So, Wesley, how you been? I am lovely. Me and my local atheist group and my lovely girlfriend, Meredith, all went camping out at Dosey Wallops. Uh, I believe it's a state park on the other side of the Hood Canal from me. It was beautiful. Uh, the water level is hella low down the creek. But, uh, yeah, great time. Good, good food. And I got the shit sunburned out of my chest and nipples and back and shoulders and i got sensitive nips right now how about you (laughs) ah been good been good (laughs) oh boy yeah i overshare all the time (laughs) (laughs) yeah all right uh, well let's see since the last time we did news uh we Mm. went to stanley on a camping trip to look for a uh, carnivorous plant that lauren is doing some well she's doing uh, some research on carnivorous plants in idaho Mm. And we found one. Yeah, we found an example of the Drosera anglica, which is this English sundew. It likes to wrap its leaves around bugs to keep them still and to digest them. It's pretty cool. Yeah. And I mm. actually was the one that found it. Sweet. It's I was like, cool. hey, Lauren, no, we're looking for red and green, right? <laughs> like, yeah. And I was like, I think this is it. Yeah, it was... Uh, pretty nice we just wandered in we wandered off into a meadow which we know knew uh from signs was a natural research area so i knew i was in the right area at least i had searched one meadow and not didn't find anything but we had gone to this next one and lo and behold as soon as we looked down they were all over the place luckily we didn't actually step on any because it was a national research area so i would hate to have uh stepped on some but if you kept out of the water, you weren't stepping on them for the most part, which is good because they were tiny little plants. They're they were really delicate mm. and so cute, and I want one. <laughs> they are cute, yes. Aww. For something that's sticky and eats bugs. Yeah. <laughs> well, one thing I, I do want to say after seeing some some news on the the atheist podcast or secret group is that uh, some people are having issues with Windows ten upgrades. Yeah. If you are a podcaster, I highly recommend having an Ubuntu Studio Live USB ready just in case. Uh, and if you decide you like it, you can go ahead and just switch to it full time and be awesome. And if you're anybody <laughs> else, uh, have Linux Mint on a, a live USB. Don't be gonna, lame. Have a Linux backup. I'm just going to add that, you know, I upgraded my laptop, Windows 10, like a champ. It's a fucking boss. <laughs> Beautiful. Runs nice. Yeah. Congratulations um, I, on being the one percent. Yay! I am in the one percent. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I did have to reinstall my generic USB drivers from Sapphire for my breakout box, but other than that, yeah, it was great. Cool. Yeah. Yay! Glad you were lucky. I I think you just don't hear from all the success stories. You're like, uh, no, I'm sure it went much smoother than people give it credit for. It's a Windows thing; they have to make fun of it. Sure. Sure. True. True. And, right. you know, if it was a Mac update, we'd be like, oh, that's $99, please. Actually, they've been giving theirs away for the last several versions. Yeah, I'm going to keep up with that stereotype, too. 
it's just a thousand dollars or fifteen hundred or two thousand when you get a new computer. Yeah, unless you want a garbage can, then it's what three, four, five. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, moving along, uh, Archway Hosting, our uh, our hosting provider and sponsor of the show. Uh, I, I want to do a little shout out to them. Now uh, we've had a couple of of issues recently. The first off was uh, getting spammed with comments on Lauren's blog. Oh. Yeah, which is now dead because I mm. didn't feel like dealing with that. Yeah, and Archway was very responsive. We had did have some downtime from it. We were the, the, the spam was so bad that it was like the, the the server we were on was hitting like full CPU utilization, and it was all off of those comments. So and the spam it was, was so bad you could taste it. It was bad. Yeah. I really didn't want to buy that many pairs of sunglasses. I just don't understand. <laughs> And then the uh, second one, uh, they they very promptly uh, identified some uh, brute force attempts against us and uh, added some protection on that. And the the support team and uh, leadership team at Archway is very responsive when you have issues. Uh, Night or day, uh, they respond quite quickly, or at least late evening. Hmm. So I've been I've been very pleased with the uh, the support. Rather badass. Yeah. So, yeah, if you're looking for a hosting provider, check out Archway Hosting at, at archwayhosting.com. That's A-R-C-H-W-A-Y hosting.com. And moving on to uh, the... We still need to get a, a new a, a name for this, this new segment. Um, putting my degree to work just doesn't quite sound right. Listeners, please tell us what we should call this. Anti-apologetics. Uh, maybe, but I don't necessarily want to be anti-apologetic with it, just... Uh, information about crazy Christian and Adventist specific stuff. Your Bible and you. <laughs> anyway, today we're going to be talking about the antediluvian period. The Ooh. book of Genesis describes the flood happening somewhere in the ballpark of 1500 years after creation and or the fall of man, depending on how long it took those first few humans to fuck it all up. So what happened during this lengthy interlude known as the antediluvian period? Not much is described in the three short chapters devoted to a period of biblical chronology that is claimed to be as long or longer than the period between Moses and Paul, which gets almost all of the pages of the Bible. Uh, during this time period, all life was vegetarian, including T-Rexes. That's, that's the one that threw me off. Uh, <laughs> I saw pictures of the creationism, creation museum, and they had pictures of dinosaurs <clears throat> eating plants next to the people. I'm like, what? Just what? And then, yes, Dustin had to point out that, yeah, according to creation theory there, that um, everything was vegetarian at some point. They only became meat eaters after. And I'm like, okay, crazy people. After the flood, to be precise, when God said that you can eat all living things, because during creation, God said you can only eat the plants of the earth and the fruit of the trees. So, I'm sorry, I I got a question too, then. Okay. T-Rexes were on the Ark? This is before the Ark. This, this is, is before yeah, this the is Flood. Before. Be- before after the flood. creation, before the Flood. Ah, okay. Be- after the Fall. Okay. Yes. And so, okay. but apparently, they, so apparently they needed these the sharp teeth to shred plants, or maybe Satan carved them into points during the Flood so they'd fossilize and make Just us think there was... Just to be tricksy. Mm-hmm. And then Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain and Abel. Abel raised sheep. And since everybody's vegetarian, they must have just been for sacrifices and wool. Cain, on the other hand, grew vegetables, doing something actually worthwhile with his time. And then after they offered sacrifices to God, Abel with a lamb and Cain with some fruit, God accepted the lamb and Cain was upset. Because God wants blood. Damn right. So after talking to God, Cain killed Abel. And then what happened next? Well, Cain ran away to the land of Nod had a son, and built a city. Which sounds kind of like a fairy tale. Like, little Prince Cain ran off to create his own castle in the land of Nod. What? Yeah, yeah. And, and most likely with this story, they just forgot to mention any daughters that were born to Adam and Eve, and so Cain was probably already fucking one of his sisters before fleeing to Nod. But Just it, a lot of angry masturbation. <laughs> but if there were only a handful of people on Earth, uh, it would just be... He, he, his wife, and their son living in Nod. Oh, it's kind of like that scene in uh, 
what was that movie called? Inception, where they built the whole city over a lifetime, but there was nobody there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So what would he be building a city for? Who would he be building it for? A house makes sense. All of his babies. But a city <laughs> would just be a ghost town unless he was hoping to snare away his nieces and nephews. And even then, only just like one or two other houses would be enough. Hmm. And for all of their babies. Babies. Anyway, Adam and Eve had another son, Seth, and probably other children that were not named. And Adam died at the ripe old age of 930, which sounds kind of like an error where they added an extra digit. Then there's a bit in Genesis 6 that talks about the sons of God, daughters of men, the Nephilim, and the mighty men of renown. The interpretation on all this is all over the place. Adventists believe the sons of God were the descendants of Seth, and the daughters of men were descended from Cain. Some believe that the sons of God are angels. And considering that these were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown, a description that sounds kind of like Hercules and his fellow Greek god-man hybrids, and also considering that one of the principles of exegesis is that the more difficult interpretation is what was probably met, this passage probably does actually describe demigods diddling human women. Maybe it was just somebody who liked to use flowery language, and they all describe just humans <laughs> the, the, they made a distinction and you don't do flowery language when paper is very expensive and, well and, and when paper is expensive you should get to the flipping point and not use <laughs> stupid flowery language then right so it probably had meaning to them mighty men of renown come on that's too many syllables <laughs> for old guys now you all could also you know I'd have to look back at the Hebrew and pull out, okay, relearn Hebrew, uh, but it could have just been a couple characters to say mighty men of renown. Come on, Dustin, put that degree to work. <laughs> and anyway, by this time, the world had become filled with violence, and so God decided to wipe out everything and start over so that he could then fill the world with his own more organized genocidal violence himself. But they were his own. He, that, that's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> the first set was obviously his own as well. Well, the violence was people's doing, not his doing. He wasn't commanding it. It was just happening. And so later, uh, after he'd identified the, the people of Israel as his, he could then actually command them to do genocide on the people he wanted to be Oh, that's Genocide. the fun part of the Bible. Okay. Yes. yes, yes. One that sadly influenced way too many of my early masturbatory fantasies. <clears throat> Teenagers should not be allowed to read the Bible. It is bad. It's twisted. It is wrong. Well, you know, donkeys. The donkeys are just talking. Yeah, they're hung like donkeys, as I recall. That's in... Uh, With semen like horses. Yes. yes. That's from uh, the Song of Solomon. Yes. Very saucy. <laughs> well, right. That's one word for it. <laughs> saucy. I would say flowery language, even. Yeah, but it was the, the exception where they decided it was worth keeping in the book. Bunch of dirty old men. So anyway, Wesley, what do you have for us for history? Ah, this day in history, August 6th, starting with... 1945 not going back very far so uh yeah this is the day that uh, we bombed hiroshima with little boy yeah oh boy oh boy so yeah this day in 1945 at 8 16 local uh, japan time uh american bomber the enola gay drops the world's first atomic bomb over the city of hiroshima approximately 80,000 people are killed as a direct result of the blast and another 35,000 are injured. At least another 60,000 would be dead by the end of the year from the effects of all that fallout. Wow. Oh, damn. So, yeah. Um, as I recall, the um, original target was uh, clouded over so they couldn't go there. Uh, uh, Hiroshima was the secondary or target, and luckily, in a way, it, it was in a valley, 
so it can tr- it, uh, kept a lot of the radiation from spreading a lot further than it could have. Now, to put some of this in context, uh, this was happening at the tail end of the firebombing of Tokyo, which over the course of a year killed more people, destroyed more buildings, wounded more people. Mm-hmm. Uh, the The difference was that it was all in one event, not spread out. They pretty much did an entire war's worth of damage in one go. Yeah. And then decided to do it again a couple weeks later. The yeah, Japanese didn't surrender. I'm not going to get into it. I did a whole report <laughs> on this in history, and I was just like, you know what? Fuck you guys. I'm not saying we were right. I'm not saying we were wrong. I'm saying it's a different no, time. No, no. I'm pretty clearly saying we're wrong. We were wrong on that one, but... Oh, well, we have to save the whole world by bombing these people. Oh. My opinion on it is that given the information that was available at the time, they made what they thought was the right decision. Yeah, I kind of sided with Dustin on that one. I've I've always kind of bought into the party line that uh, a lot of lives were saved by, American lives were saved by that, which I'm not, I'm saying that's pretty fucked up, but. I would, I would just, I, from what I read, I don't think that many American lives would have been lost if we had gone, been going much further. A whole lot of more Japanese lives would have been lost. Tokyo, you know, was still being just ravaged. Um, but Americans were, they were doing all, they were doing all right. They weren't, they weren't suffering huge, massive two million people casualties. So, and, and then putting our people above other people to me is a very foreign concept it just seems wrong to wipe out two million people off the earth because you guys can't get along what they were anticipating though was that like with the, with the island hopping what they were finding was that the japanese soldiers were completely dedicated and would fight to the death right because that's what we would do no we wouldn't red dawn for the, the island hopping, they had to kill every last Japanese soldier. Kamikaze pilots flying their planes into ships. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty brutal. Yeah, I also do understand from discussing this with you that the Japanese were planning on surrendering prior to dropping the bomb. Yes, they had a much more formal arrangement where they wrote out contracts agreeing to um, basically uh, surrendering t- surrender terms, which the Western world would not have accepted anyway but it was still a given in japanese culture that you would still do that part even if you know even if the other power is like no way you still do that and it takes a few days to write that all up but in the meantime they got bombed anyway and then it happened again and it's really the second bomb that pisses me off that should have never happened but like i said i'm trying to speak against a whole history here so the second bomb was because of the the Western perspective on warfare was that you ask for a ceasefire if you're going to be discussing terms and the terms aren't pre-prepared. You sit down and you discuss it. And if you can't do that, then you just do an unconditional surrender like, like Germany did. The U.S. was expecting the same thing. They and saw Japan the... Japan was mum. Yeah, and Japan was... was kept quiet so the u.s saw the first bomb as being ineffective so they figured maybe a second one would get the japanese attention it's really just this is horrible but it's an oh, example yeah. of the worst most costly cultural misunderstanding in history yeah yeah i could see yeah, that. i'd agree with that they were not only speaking different languages but had completely different rules of war in mind it, and you how can you end a war if you have different rules on how the war ends? Of course, I'm pretty sure the Japanese weren't, you know, expecting nice long terms of surrender when they went and raped the coastal coastal cities of Korea and China and the Philippines and Indonesia either. Yeah. <laughs> so, all's fair in love and war. <laughs> how about some happy news? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, not really. <laughs> uh, this day in history, 1965, the Voting Rights Act is approved. So this is kind of a good thing. Well, it's definitely a good thing, but uh, only in re- response to lots of bad things. Yeah. Uh, 
So anyways, voting, voting rights act. Yes, yes, yes. A uh, landmark piece of federal legislation in the U S that prohibits racial discrimination in voting, uh, signed into law by president Lyndon B Johnson during the height of the American civil rights movement in 1965. Yeah. Congress later amended the act five times to expand its protections. So it's designed to enforce the voting rights guaranteed by the 14th and 15th amendments to the United States constitution. So according to the department of justice, the act is considered to be the most effective piece of civil rights legislation ever enacted in the country. Uh, going way back on this a little bit though, uh, as initially ratified the United States constitution granted each state complete discretion to determine voter red voter qualifications for its residents. Uh, after the Civil War, however, the three Reconstruction Amendments were ratified and limited this discretion. Uh, the 13th Amendment in 1865 prohibited slavery, of course. 14th in 1968 grants citizenship to anyone born or naturalized in the United States and guarantees every person due process and equal protection rights. Uh, a couple of years later, in 1870, the 15th Amendment provides that the rights of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. So, yeah, these these uh, amendments also empower Congress to en enforce their provisions through, quote unquote, appropriate legislation. And, uh, yeah, this voting rights thing, you know, is just an amazing thing at the time. And thankfully you know most places really don't need to have this enforced anymore but there are still actually uh 28 counties in the you know, united states that still have the federal government you know monitoring them uh because of the voting rights and uh well we're hearing that pop up in the news all the time now i was going to point out one in particular here uh which is a interesting side note about sandra bland the lady who was recently arrested for the bullshit reason and found dead in a prison cell in Hempstead, Texas. Uh, and that is inside Waller County in Texas is one of those 28 counties. Keeping hmm. an eye on you, Waller. Yeah. <laughs> fucking A. That's okay. We know you're good people. Some of you. We're watching the rest of you. Mm. So yeah, isn't that great? Yeah. 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 And it's a shame that the Supreme court gutted it. They did, they did. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's what you get. <laughs> that's what you get. <laughs> yeah, that's you, what, seriously, that's, a, that's what, if you elect uh, asshole, you know, <laughs> judges, that's what you're going to get. Well, right leaning judges. Yeah. And, and the, uh, because the Voting Rights Act initially applied to quite a few states that had a history of discriminating, mostly in the South. Go figure. Yeah. I think it's what the South, Arizona, and Alaska. I guess they added the A's just for for good measure, or because they were racist assholes. The racism, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I bet on that. Yeah, your state's <sighs> name starts with an A. Your neighbor may be an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> Say it with me, kids. A stands for <laughs> asshole. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> oh, and a little quickie here. On this day in 1996, George R.R. R. Martin's Game of Thrones debuts. Yeah, the first book in uh, the Fire and Ice series. All right. Hmm. Nice. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I was so, uh, with the the TV series. I was actually about halfway through season five when Lauren finally watched a little bit with me and decided we had to start all over. Oh. Yeah, I finally wanted to see dragons and zombies. <laughs> I didn't know there were zombies. That that oh, won yeah. me over. Zombies, hell yeah. Ice zombies. Uh, I The way I understand it, that uh, the people that, that actually direct the show for HBO were not allowed to do anything, create the show at all, until they guessed who Jon Snow's mother was. There was some sort of little thing that uh, George wouldn't let them do it until they figured it out. Hmm. I don't know if that's true or not, but I've, I have it from good nerd sources. Nice. Sir, we would like to make a TV show out of your books and so you could earn millions and millions of dollars. Well, I have a riddle for you. No. That, no. 
Well, you know, just to show that they actually read the books and understand it and have some good ideas. And totally <laughs> not follow along at all. <laughs> well, they don't have to now. I mean, the the, the show is past the books, aren't, isn't it? Joe, I think the show is past the books and is set to end, finally. Mm. Oh, I don't great. remember what the date is. I'm sure we'll have people emailing you what date it is, but it was just announced. <laughs> mm. They well, also just I, announced that they've cast the Three-Eyed Raven. Eh? Hmm. They, they cast it? With a human actor. I was going to say into Peter. Oh, okay. I was like, well, they could use Sir Reginald the Crow. They could use <laughs> Mr. Poe the Crow. Holly, I'm sure Hollywood Animal Trainers has p- crows. St- stick a little googly eye on its forehead. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and totally unrelated, the video game Destiny, put out by Bungie, as I recall, just stopped using Peter Dinklage as their main voice actor for one of the characters. I was very upset. Very sad. Mm. Ah, Mm. I wonder if he was starting to cost too much. Dinklage, Peter Dinklage, Peter Dinklage. He is awesome. (laughs) Yeah, that's something that me and Meredith do, is sing the entire song of Iron Eyes that the show has. Just saying Peter Dinklage over and over. (laughs) <laughs> Isn't the show called Game of Thrones? Mm-hmm. The book is called Fire and Ice. Yes, the series. The song of Fire and Ice. The song. Oh, that is the. So- oh, that's the that's name the of the series. I didn't get your joke because I'm not really into the whole culture thing yet. Dinklage, Peter Dinklage. Peter that I get though. <laughs> <laughs> I get that reference. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> and finally, this day in 2012, the Curiosity. L- rover lands on mars Woo! yay uh, yay curiosity is a volkswagen bug sized robotic rover exploring the gale crater on mars as part of the as part of nasa's mars science laboratory mission the msl and it's powered by a idaho nuclear reactor really yay from us the, from the idaho national laboratory oh that's where it got its plutonium 238 the, yeah. the whole reactor was built there. Oh, sweet. Yeah. The Idaho uh, National Laboratory, formerly known as the Idaho Nuclear Laboratory. Formerly known as the Idaho Nuclear Environment and Energy Laboratory. Wow. That was a long name. Yeah, they, <laughs> cut, they cut that down. That's why. Uh, man, yeah. Uh, Curiosity was launched from Cape Canaveral on November 26, 2011, aboard the MSL spacecraft and landed in the Alio. Aeolius Palace, I fucking nailed that, in uh, the Gale Crater on Mars, uh, August 6, 2012. All told, the rover, rover traveled about 350 million miles and kilometers, uh, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, rover's goals included in investigation of the Martian climate and geology, assessment of whether the selected field site Inside the Gale Crater has ever offered environmental conditions favorable for microbial life, including investigation of the role of water and planetary ability studies in preparation for future human exploration. Yay! Uh, Yay! So, we like that. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, the, the design of the, of the little rover will serve as a basis for a planned Mars 2020 rover mission. And... Even better, in December 2012, Curiosity's two-year mission was extended indefinitely, and that's basically due to the power source that Dustin and Lauren were talking about just a bit ago. Mm-hmm. Because that motherfucking can keep on going, just like Viking 1 and 2. Which I think their power plants also came from INL. Hmm. Most of the uh, nuclear power plants in space all came from there. I really like the idea of this whole thing. <laughs> Uh, radio isotope power systems, RPSs, um, the generators that produce electricity from the decay of radioactive isotopes, such as, you know, the, in this case, plutonium-238, which is a non fissible isotope of plutonium, uh, just uses heat uh, that's given off from the decay of this isotope that's uh, converted into electric voltage by thermocouples. And, nice. uh, yeah, all the waste heat can be used and... Sh- uh, ported out to other parts of the system via pipes to help keep the system warm. And keep it toasty in cold, cold space. Aww. Yeah, yeah. a lot 
nicer use of nuclear power than what they were doing at their sister site, Hanford. Yeah, well, yeah. Hanford's just like storage anymore. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're trying to turn Idaho into that too. <laughs> well, it's on the Columbia, so you know, yeah. And we've got the Snake River and a huge aquifer. Surely nothing will go wrong. <laughs> well, nothing's ever went wrong at Hanford, so come on. Yeah, just ask my mom's <laughs> oncologist. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, that's all I got. All right, and we were getting off topic. So uh, we're going to take a quick <laughs> break, and we will be back with science. We love hearing from our listeners. You can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com, tweet us at atheistnomads, send us a message on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash atheistnomads, or better yet, call us and leave us a message at 541 203 0666. We might even play it on the show. You can also help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast directory of choice. In a time, in a place, in a world, millions have suddenly vanished and no one knows why. What is behind this mystery? Is it man? Is it evil? Is it God? Stay on top of the breaking news with your KUSA 9 News and I team, your podcast leader and investigative journalism. Find out more information about the Atheist Apocalypse podcast at atheistapocalypse.com, baby. This time, it's for Snarius. time for science and technology brought to you by lauren got a couple good ones here for one i just want to start out by saying ai robots are not going to kill us really bunches of really smart people said they might ah they're so alarmist it is driving me crazy don't go out into space bad aliens will come kill us don't develop good robots bad robots will kill us I don't see those same people making those two arguments. Oh, Stephen Hawking did. Talking about not going into space? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, specifically, he said that um, just because was that we may be attracting attention, we may, may not be happy with what kind of attention we'll, we're attracting. Oh, So okay. he's been very alarmist over the ten year, past 10 years. Well, I mean, I've watched Star Trek. I mean, they're not going to come unless we develop work to warp technology it's right. only if it's the vulcans well then there's the doctor who and uh or we're just kind of forced into it but then we blow them up with a giant laser now i'm more concerned about ai than my, my yeah. wife is yeah and in particular with the military use of it yeah because military roombas might destroy everything yeah uh, actually, more concerned, more than I'm concerned with automated robots. Well, okay, my big fear there is making it so that war is so sterile easy. that it's too easy. That's yeah. what everybody said a hundred years ago, right? We're living that now, and it sucks. No, it doesn't. We've been at war for the last hundred years. Yeah, I think we were probably like that before. It just wasn't very well documented. No, no, we weren't. Okay, the guess gets the Indians. Okay, so our first story is about that pesky little disease, Ebola. You guys all remember Ebola, right? That was so last year. But and still going on. Shush. Nobody <laughs> cares now. There's no Facebook crowd caring about it anymore, so it must not be a problem. However, it is. Uh, Ebola vaccine trial has been shown to be 100% effective in the country of Guinea, where uh, they've been running some studies to try and see, you know, try and get decent vaccine out there. So when you're doing these kind of medical trials, there's a certain way that you can do it, where you take half of the participants, give them the vaccine, and then the other half you give placebo. However, there are certain medical conditions that cause such, such death and destruction in its wake that they can't afford to do that. So this was modeled after a similar trial with smallpox vaccine in the 1970s. That is where you wait for a flare-up, and then you give vaccines to anybody who is willing, who has been in close contact with somebody infected, 
but you exclude children, adolescents, pregnant women, and probably the elderly. And when you exclude that, it ends up being about 50% of the population. Damn. So um, anybody who can be vaccinated is vaccinated, and they spread it out into either immediate vaccination or a three-week delay vaccination. What they found was the 2,000 people that they vaccinated immediately, nobody developed Ebola. Oh, um, the delayed group, less one, than 1% developed the disease with a three-week delay. So that is still really good. So in places that don't have a vaccine immediately available, there is still, there's still going to be uh, hope for that. Uh, there are outbreaks going on still in Guinea and in... Oh, crap. It just left my brain. I looked this up earlier. Is it Sierra Leone? Who's They're one of the countries in that area. Yeah. There's a couple of countries that are still suffering from Ebola, and this is hopefully going to knock it out. Uh, assuming, of course, that no weird strains develop, um, and hopefully they can use this vaccine in the future, assuming that the next strain is closely related. Nice. Yeah. In happier news, <laughs> scientists have developed the first new lager yeast. The first in centuries. So I, I expect everyone to raise your beer in a toast. Here, to, here. To new lager. I am drinking my third crappy lager. An already <laughs> mild and boring flavor that might now get an expanse and have micro brews go crazy. So yeah, the science behind wait. this. The yeast used in the brewing of lagers is a hybrid of the Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Uh, that is the origin of all brewing and baking yeasts. That's one that you're probably most familiar with if you ever took biology. That's the one they study. And Saccharomyces eubayanus. That is a wild yeast that wasn't even identified until 2011. Now, to be clear, I verified this with Dustin. This yeast has been around this whole time. It's been in all the loggers for as far back as, you know, they've been loggering. Uh, it just wasn't identified until 2011. So what they found was this yeast that was the perfect hybrid, hybridizer. They could just mix it with just about anything and come up with a new, new yeast. Uh, so this is really exciting. Um, don't know if Bavarian Germany is going to take this up. They tend to stick to traditionals. But I think that here in America, we're going to see a whole, whole new expanse of uh, microbrew lagers. Maybe they'll even come up with one that you'll like. Not likely. <laughs> Beer it's, tastes like beer. Well, lager tastes like piss. Well, yeah. Hopefully but. not for long. Um, with uh, S. Eubenos, Eubenianos, Eubenianos, <laughs> anus. <laughs> 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 with this new yeast, <laughs> they're able to create a successful cross that produced alcohol faster and at higher concentrations with more flavors. So what we're seeing in wheats, raspberry wheats, uh, summer shandies, lemonade uh, mixes, all that. We're going to start going to start seeing that in lager, so it's going to be very exciting. I like um, a shandy. Maybe even locale lagers that don't taste like crap. <laughs> and this is uh, this next story is one that I had to throw on. Uh, mm. We were talking earlier about how we spent our weekend in Stanley exploring the muddy dredges of wetlands to find carnivorous plants. Mm -hmm. The ones that we were looking for was a sundew. Uh, how those work is the leaf is covered in little red spines that at each tip is a little ball of mucus. And when a bug lands on that leaf, it gets stuck in the mucus. The leaf curls around it, gets more mucus stuck on it, and then emits a digestive enzyme, turns the bug into a little buggy stew, and then it eats up what's left, <laughs> um, usually leaving a pretty much used up leaf and a carapace of bug behind huh. what's exciting was that a new species of this sundew has recently been found via pictures shared on facebook wow yeah. slack to science slack to science so this is the first species that's ever been found via social media and what happens is people like me go out and trudging through wetlands and taking pictures of plants and posting it on Facebook, where some very bored botanist, apparently, scrolls through all these photos, says, oh, yeah, I know what that is. I know what that is. Oh, I didn't know that grew there. Makes a note and goes on. That's really common um, for people to post pictures of a plant from a new region 
and they're able to say, okay, this plant exists here now. What they've never found was a brand new species. Uh, Reginaldo Vascolicelos of Brazil took such a picture and uploaded it to Facebook in 2013. Uh, Andreas Fleischmann, a co-author of the research paper, said is the largest sundew in the Americas and the second largest carnivorous plant in the Americas. In respect, it is also a spectacular plant. Uh, it was named Drosera magnifica. You can probably guess why. Magnifica. And it only grows on the side of the single mountain where, surprisingly, it's easily accessible. So they are considering it critically endangered due to uh, possible ranching and tourism on that little mm. mountain. And that would be really sad to finally, you know, find a new species and then boop, everybody wants to go take a picture and share on Facebook and it's gone. That would be sad. But uh, yeah. just to give you an idea, the plant we saw was probably about six centimeters across. So about the size of your palm. Mm-hmm. Cute little, cute little sundew. The one that these guys found was 24 centimeters average leaf length. So that's like, that's like a forearm. That was a huge plant. Wow. And it was surprising that this area, which is very well known for its hiking, that nobody ever bothered to post a picture or actually document that these were there. This is really cool, guys. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, go post your pictures because they're finding new stuff all the time just in people's backyards. Citizen science! Yay. Yay. All right, we're going to take another quick break, and then we'll be back with Politics and Religion. As a listener of the show, I'm going to assume you love my sexy vocal stylings. If you love the rest of the show as much as my voice, consider giving us the resources we desperately need to purchase quality cocaine at Red Bull. We make it super easy to make a one-time donation or to support us on a per-episode, monthly, or even annual basis using PayPal or Patreon. Find out more at AtheistNomads.com. Use the links on the right side of the page. A dollar an episode is all we ask. The Catholic Church in Kenya has been trying to block the latest polio vaccination campaign in the country because of alleged safety concerns. Mm. Opposition, unfortunately, did result in a five-month delay, but the vaccinations are now distributed and are scheduled to be administered. Specifically, they are demanding that it be tested in a laboratory of their choosing without specifying what part they're wanting tested or why they are actually concerned. The country's regulations actually only require that the vaccine be certified by a World Health Organization approved laboratory, which it has been. The Catholic Church does have a history of opposing vaccination in Kenya, claiming that a tetanus vaccine was laced with a hormone to make women infertile. Fortunately, the Health Cabinet Secretary, James Masharia, responded by telling the Catholic Church to stay out of the discussion. In other words, he told them to shut the fuck up. Unfortunately, there are some 30 members of parliament who have vowed to make sure that no one agrees to vaccination. Well, it's the same old story that keeps popping up um, in typically uneducated areas where a vaccine will cause sterilization. Now, it is actually a very rare side effect, and that actually could have happened. But um, the dangers of sterility through a vaccine are imma- unimaginably tiny. Tiny, tiny, tiny. would be what? Like in a country the size of Kenya, one person maybe? maybe. One person in 20 years yeah. kind of thing. It is so rare for that to happen. Well, and what's crazy with that, this is uh, Africa and the Muslim world is where this is most commonly seen, this fear. If a company figured out a way to do that, they would be wealthy. If women in the Western world could just get a vaccine and be infertile. We don't want babies. That If it was a temporary effect be a lot cheaper and easier than than oral contraceptives or a uh, iud and if it's permanent a lot easier than surgery yeah uh this this particular yeah. infertile rumor is is it drives me crazy but that is because i am from the western world and i think that's where most of the fear is laced is a fear of the western medicine coming in and it's going to take away their way of life you know, the Catholic Church has had oh a couple of years to to stick their nose into this and god damn it. It it's time they got the fuck out of this. I mean, the original vaccine was uh, Salk was what, nineteen fifty two and actual mm-hmm. vaccines were like fifty seven? That's like fifty eight years ago. You know 
damn near 60 years. I mean, there's enough time for them to have had their wrong say and get the fuck out. Now, one awesome thing with, with this particular version of the vaccine, the, the oral vaccination, it's a live virus. It's one that won't make you sick, but just like polio, it is contagious through your feces. So areas with poor sanitation, areas where polio runs the most rampant, the vaccine will infect other people and give them immunity to polio. Oh my gosh, I wish that was true for every vaccine. Then we wouldn't have this stupid debate. Yeah, the herd immunity would be amazing. They need to make an MMR that's airborne. (laughs) Ah, man. But, yeah, and and as far as the Catholic Church in Africa goes, Sub-Saharan Africa in particular, they just straight up need to shut up when it comes to medicine. Because they are directly involved in the propagation of the HIV epidemic there by opposing condoms. That is an area where even if they're opposed to condoms for contraceptives, it'd be a good idea there. But they are so unbending. Ugh. Fuck you, Pope Francis. Uh, moving on to some happier news. The uh, a bill sponsored by last year's joke of a candidate, now Iowa junior Senator Joni Ernst, sought to block preventative Medicaid reimbursements and federal family planning funding from going to Planned Parenthood. The motion to bring the bill to a vote failed 53 to 46. Oh, that's too close. And this is because there's a rule that because of the risk of filibuster, they have to vote to see if they will vote. And if they don't get 60 votes, it doesn't get a vote. One Republican, Mark Kirk of Illinois, voted with the Democrats against the motion, and two Democrats, Joe Donnelly of Indiana and Joe Manchin of West Virginia, voted with the Republicans for the motion. And I would have loved an old-fashioned filibuster against this. (laughs) It would have been so awesome, especially since, considering the topic, Planned Parenthood's family planning and preventative care the filibuster would have been people reading from like patient testimonials about getting cancer screenings and birth control at Planned Parenthood. Yeah. It would have been amazing. Well, one, one thing that's nice that's coming out of all this is uh, Planned Parenthood has received more donations in the past like two months than they have in the past several years combined. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the way I've understood it, uh, Planned Parenthood doesn't spend a single dollar, federal dollar, on abortions, except in the cases of uh, rape or incest, which are still rape. I believe it's no money goes to abortions per federal law, period. Uh, I'm pretty sure on this one. Google but it! Abortions also only make up 3% of what Planned Parenthood does. Oh, yeah. I mean, pap smears, breast exams. I mean, I, I'd, yeah, I'd be I mean, willing if- to help with the breast exams. <laughs> but they never call. Did you hear that? That was me rolling my eyes. Nice. <laughs> I can totally hear that over the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and along the same vein, GOP presidential candidate Mike Huckabee spoke on the topic of abortion at two campaign stops in Iowa. At the first, he said that he would, and I quote, invoke the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments for the protection of every human being. He went on to claim that science has proven that fetuses are human beings, whatever the hell that means, and said, and I quote again, I will not pretend there is nothing we can do to stop this. At the next stop, a reporter asked him how he would stop abortions and if this would involve using the FBI or federal forces. His reply was, we'll see if I get to be president. Great. That is the worst way to campaign ever. We'll see. No, that's... (laughs) Well, I think he has to say that because last last election, he was saying that he was chosen by God and God was his running mate, essentially. Yeah. Wasn't he saying that this time, too? I, I don't think I've heard him say that this election cycle. But well, that whole, we'll see if I get to be president, means that he's got stuff that he plans to do when he gets to be president that he's not being forthcoming about. Mm-hmm. That's terrifying. Um, also, it is still up to debate whether or not a fetus, at what point a fetus becomes a human being. And it's not even really a scientific topic because it's a sliding scale. It's a, it's a gray area. At conception, yes, it has human DNA. It is human tissue. 
it's not an independent human being. And uh, prior to the point of viability, you cannot make a 100% solid argument that, that is, in fact, a human being. I mean, there are Terranomas that have more features of a human being than a fetus. I, st- yeah. I still say once it's viable outside the womb, it's a, it's a person. Yeah, because at that point, your options, if you're, you're trying to do an abortion, the other option is a C-section. Oh, and uh, via Politico and PBS, uh, by law, federal dollars don't pay for abortions except in limited circumstances involving rape, incest, or protecting the life of the woman. Okay. Federal law is more uh, reasonable than I thought it was. Awesome. Hmm. Uh, but this is kind of scary, though, that Mike Huckabee is effectively threatening to send the army to abortion clinics if he gets the chance. Well, I'm sure just the National Guard, and those are like the Boy Scouts of the army. Uh, it's kind of sending f- federal troops is not the National Guard. Well, it doesn't even, I mean... It's not like women choose to go have an abortion all willy nilly. We don't. We don't do it for fun. This really? isn't some kind of I pleasure would. cruise. This is people who are making a terrible, horrible, hard medical decision, and they are criminalizing it to the point where, I mean, it's it's dangerous to even doubt your pregnancy. It's dangerous to be a woman. Oh, that's true. That's but there was also that study that came out not too long ago saying that uh, women that have abortions. Uh, right after and like years after are still think it's the right i right thing that they they did the right thing yeah it was a it was a magnificent number it was like in the 90s yeah 90th yeah, yeah. percentile yeah women don't regret it because well you're born to be selfish you're born to want to live and to want to live healthily and then if you do have offspring for that offspring to live healthily mm-hmm. um and also, it's, it really comes down to how you phrase questions like that, because I'm sure oh, there's, true. there's a lot of women who, if they had to make the same decision again, would. Do they feel bad about it? Yeah. But that's... True. If the question yeah. was more along the lines of mentioning shame, mm-hmm. I'm, sure the, I'm sure it would have turned out totally different. But this was regret. Yeah. And, um, yeah. This is, um, this is definitely going to be the presidential vote of if if you have a vagina or have dark skin you need to go vote <laughs> it's come to a head and vote democrat bernie in case that's there's any question bernie. There. i mean yeah he's an old white guy but i don't like his stance on gmos but pretty much everything else i'm fucking all there he he wants gmo labeling past that yeah i pretty much love the guy yeah um anyway let's go ahead and move on we got a little bit of semi-sweet news Ooh. a uh, bittersweet no not even bittersweet oh. a, a, a bigot <laughs> in new york started hurling homophobic uh bullshit at a gay couple in soho and then took a swing at one of them oh. that was daniel lennox chaote his husband larry uh beat his ass and Little threw him to the know. curb Little did the bigot know. (laughs) They're both West Point graduates. Fucking A. This is awesome. These men were the first people to have a same-sex wedding at West Point. Nice. It was after they both graduated, but yeah, these are Army veterans. Uh, At least one of them has done tours in both Afghanistan and Iraq. They have served their country. And how do they get... What, what kind of thanks do they get? A punch in the face. And the most awesome thing from here is from uh, Larry. We refuse to be victims and are thankful we can defend ourselves, but are saddened by the fact that idiots like this guy might not pick two guys who went through plebe boxing next time. What is plebe boxing? Plebes are the freshmen at a service academy. Just think uh, newbies. So freshman boxing at West Point... Yeah, they know how to throw a punch. Oh, is, if they're freshmen, I would assume that they didn't know how to throw a punch because they're freshmen. Oh, by the oh. end of their freshman year, they do. Yeah. And moving along, sheriff's offices around the country are putting in God we trust on their patrol cars. A douche move, but under the court precedent, it is just ceremonial deism. One sheriff, Donald Valenza, from Houston County, Alabama, has gone further 
with bumper decals with the department badge surrounded by blessed are the peacemakers and the citation of Matthew 5, 9. Valenza backs up this action saying, I've always had religious belief and I feel like that's kept me alive. We've used that quote with the special response team for 15 years. It symbolizes the Houston County Sheriff's Office. We have strong beliefs. FFRF has already sent him a letter and he will have a hard time having a passage from the Sermon on the Mount dismissed as ceremonial deism. You know, if they wanted to have blessed are the cheesemakers, I'd be cool with that. (laughs) (sighs) Pass that, man. Get a fucking life. Well, it's just he probably has a cross that he wears, and really that's all he needs to do. He has belief. That's great. But not everybody. Seriously, everybody. You know what? Even if it was everybody, that's not the point. They are civil servants. They serve everyone. And the First Amendment applies to them. You know what's funny is that they probably choose not to serve everyone if they could. Yeah, most likely. Uh, this is Alabama, after all. But the the First Amendment, the, the Establishment Clause, it sucks that that isn't being applied against In God We Trust, but quoting the New Testament, there is very strong precedence that that is not okay for the government to do. And when you put a bumper sticker on a patrol car, that's even worse than just simple government endorsement of religion. That is government endorsement of religion with a gun. Yeah, it, it, that, that's officially overstepping boundaries. Um, it'd be one thing if it was a congressperson or, you know, on the Capitol steps. We're always fighting those. But uh, police officers have become, well, not too good looking in the past couple of years. And fear is a big problem when it comes to the populace trusting the people that are supposed to be keeping the peace. Mm-hmm. Giving those people a reason to lash out, not gonna, it's not going to work out. And moving on, second grade teacher Michelle Meyer of Forest Park Elementary School in Indiana has been sued for banishing a seven-year-old student of hers, identified as A.B., to eating alone for three days. <laughs> the reason was that he had told a girl that he did not believe in God. From the lawsuit, Ms. Meyer asked A.B. if he had told the girl that he did not believe in God, and A.B. said he had and asked what he'd done wrong. Ms. Meyer asked A.B. if he went to church, whether his family went to church, and whether his mother knew how he felt about God. She also asked A.B. if he believed that maybe God exists. Then after that, uh, he had to speak to another adult about it, which also left him feeling like like he had done something wrong. And then he had to eat alone during lunch, forbidden from talking to other students that he had supposedly offended for three days. That is so sad. What's even worse, he used to love school. Now he hates it and thinks that everyone hates him. Well, yeah. I just want to give that little kid a hug and a hot dog because hot dogs are awesome for school lunches. No, pizza. You know what? That kid deserves no. pizza day. He deserves the rectangle pizza with all the oil. Yes. <laughs> all the oils. Oh, yeah. No, but that is, that is, hor- these, I mean, kids have it hard enough. Making friends and keeping friends. This is just cruel. And yeah. yeah, I hope she gets fired for that. That's cruel and unusual punishment for somebody his age. Uh, the school district has condemned her actions. Hooray. Yeah, what? Gave her paid leave? A statement condemning her actions. Oh, great. No. A letter not in even the paid jacket. Leave. Yeah, and not that. even admitting that she had done them, just that if she had done that, that it would have been wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She needs to be fired. There are Christian schools she can go work at, and I think she'd be better suited there. I would like to see the other one that was questioning him, you know, be censured at least also. Yeah. Yeah. Because that that other adult response should have been... So what? What are you doing? Let's go talk to the principal, Ms. Meyer. (laughs) Yeah, if anybody knows Ms. Meyer, start, start sending her... I don't know, not threatening letters. Come on, people, but no, oh, no. just mean ones. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, we're going to go ahead and move on to feedback now. And letters, we got letters. Yes, from Dave via Facebook. Hi, I'm a Brit living in China, and I love your show, especially the atheist banter. <laughs> 
I thought you might like the article about science taking 350 years to get to the answer of why pendulum clocks synchronize. We may take our time, but we always get there. Strangely, <laughs> the answer isn't because God makes it like that. Keep up the good work, Dave. Fucking A, Dave. And, you know, a Brit living in China? Dude, send some pictures. Seriously, <laughs> I beg for pictures off of anybody that sends us, you know, mail from, well, really anywhere. And we have a lot of listeners in China. I, I think they have passed up New Zealand finally in oh, our, sure. our rankings. Uh, this is the first time we've heard from one of our, our Chinese, well, our listeners living in China. New Zealand, you, you got some catching up to do. Come on. Uh-huh. You're a small <laughs> country, but we believe in you. Oh. And if you, you come across my family's uh, royal tapestries in Christchurch, uh, feel free to send them my way. Yes. Anyway, to the, the, the point about the, uh, the clocks and the pendulums, uh, what they found is that it is sound. When they hit the, the end of their swing, they emit a little bit of noise. And if clocks are on the same wall close to each other, they will, that, that energy from that will affect the other. And as they do that over the course of a couple of days, they will synchronize in the opposite direction. Hmm. Say what? That is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That took me a moment to visualize. Yeah. And then uh, from Physics. Jason Ford at JCC Ford on Twitter at Atheist Nomads at Dr. Zach. You got him? Exclamation question mark. Exclamation sweet. Exclamation mark. I loved his podcast. Exclamation mark. Exclamation mark. All right, a little bit too much on the on the punctuation there. But I appreciate <laughs> Thank you, the Dustin. Thoughts. Okay, let me do that over again. That was a direct message for that guy. <laughs> but <laughs> no, that was a tweet. I, I know, open. I know, I know. Oh yeah, it's like I wasn't directing my comment at you; I was directing it at him. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> hey, he's got 140 characters to use as he sees fit. He does. Yeah, don't he diss does. him. <laughs> yeah and yeah dr zach had been uh, i'd been wanting to get him for for a while i'd actually tried to get onto apologia unfortunately the timing was as it was dying yeah yeah oh well but you know we like picking up and you know bringing our dusting off our our old friends you know our, mm -hmm. our old podcast friends that we used to listen to and having them come on the show and getting to talk to them yeah and from Camtastic. That's at K A M M M Tastic. That's three M's. My fave interviews with at Ryan J Bell at Year Without God were by at Atheist Nomads and at Everyone's Agnostic. Love hearing all your deconversion stories. Okay. And then Ryan, then Ryan replied with, "Oh wow, Atheist Nomads is so long ago. I need to re-listen to that." Also, Everyone's Agnostic is one of my faves. Aww. Oh, so much love. And so Cam pointed out that he did two interviews with us and both were great. And Damn you can skippy. find you can find those both in our archives. Uh we did one uh at the beginning of the year in 2014 and then one right at the beginning of 2015. We actually recorded it right before the end, but back you know, had a little backlog and yeah. Yeah. Anyway, you can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com or you can call us at 541-203-0666. Tweet us at Atheist Nomads or hit us up on Facebook. And yeah, the phone may seem uh, old school, but we love listening to voicemails. Yes, they are amazing. They make us happy. Or you could, you know, go a little bit more techie and fucking, you know, record a message, record an MP3 on your, on your computer or phone or whatever and well, email it to us. Yeah. Then we'll have like clean audio and we won't have to make, you know, guesses on all the weird stuff that you say over Google Voice. Mm hmm. <laughs> and we have no new supporters, but if you want to support us, you can always hit up the website and look for the PayPal and Patreon links on the right hand side of the page. Uh, every little bit helps and helps keep us going. And don't forget to use the Amazon click through to buy all your sex toys like I do. You know, You'll see, you won't notice a difference in the prices, but, you know, you'll be supporting great people just like us. And Wesley and Lauren, thank you both for joining me. Yay! All of our oh. listeners, thank you so much for listening. Yay! Yay! And we'll be back next week with the conclusion of the Dr. Zach interview. Yay!
Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find us online at www.atheistnomads.com. Contact us at contact at atheistnomads.com or leave us a voicemail message at 541-203-0666. You can also like us on Facebook or leave us a review on iTunes, Zoom, or wherever else you find the podcast. Until next time, this has been The Atheist Nomads. Bucky, shut up. (laughs) He doesn't know that word. Quiet. Good boy. Not you. Sorry. I know that. I know shut up.